Okay. Welcome, welcome back. Welcome back. Episode 201. So uh, if you joined us for last week's uh, episode, uh, one of my friends uh, who was actually on, wasn't on the panel, he was on uh, on the receiving end, uh, had to get up early and sent me a message. You guys are still on. Um, we had quite the long episode. So uh, for those of you going back to listen to the recording, uh, it was a little over three hours long. So um, we promised not to uh, not to go that long <laughs> for this one. Although James said if I left him in charge, it'd be the shortest episode ever. So um, well, we know where his uh, allegiance lies, don't we? Anyway, all right. So um, <clears throat> what we're going to take a look at during this episode is uh, actually based on um, an email that I sent out to my subscriber list last week uh, focused on this uh, kind of an argument between uh, two different sides, right? Traditional or modern, right? Which needed to, should we be doing, right? So we'll, we'll take a look at that. <clears throat> and uh, also, this also marks kind of a change or a little shift in uh, maybe layout format and whatnot of the podcast. So uh, lots to talk about. So we'll take care of, uh, take care of that and take a look at things uh, as soon as we get started. The big question is this, how are self-defense and success-minded people like us, concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world? How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge, and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves, and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kudan Radio. Real training for real people in a real world. All right. And my system just glitched on me. So, <laughs> all right. Anyway, hey, uh, so uh, that's Yael Miller here, your strategy and tactics guy uh, from Warrior Concepts. So uh, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who've been uh, listeners, long-time listeners, first-time caller. Anyway, uh, so, uh, and for those of you just joining us, uh, welcome to you as well. So again, this is episode 201, right? So uh, we are well into things. And if you joined us for our celebration last week, uh, you uh, got a chance to uh, hear just um, how far uh, or how different that is, right? Considering that uh, the average podcast that starts doesn't make it past the fifth episode. And uh, after that, people tend to quit at about the 20 mark. And uh, so... We 10x that, which is uh, which is really cool. Anyway, uh, it either means that uh, we're living this perseverance endurance thing, or James and I have nothing better to do on a Monday night. I don't know. <clears throat> I think it's a little bit of both. No, it's that's anyway. So, um, let me just bring up some notes here because I don't want to forget anything. And uh, so, All right. Sorry. All right. So sorry about the dead time for those of you listening audio only. Anyway. All right. So, um, so I'm titling this one kind of new beginnings, right? But um, so here's the thing. Kuden, this podcast is a way for me, us, right? To help people that are on a very specific path. Okay. So, uh, we tend to lean in the direction of ninjutsu, but this is open to anybody, regardless of martial arts, self-defense, uh, system affiliation, anything like that. We're really looking at folks who, uh, my, my new term is warrior protectors, right? But they're also, uh, you know, we, could, we could use the phrase hero protector, right? And, but, but what we're looking at here is a blend of self-protection and personal development, right? So th there's a certain breed, right? That not, doesn't just bump into this, but, but really sticks with it, right? So here's the thing. I am here to help those looking to make huge differences, right? Tremendous leaps, right? And I don't know, at the risk of sounding cheesy, right? Quantum levels of progress, in their training, right, and their understanding, and in their progress, okay? So this show is an integral part of the overall training 
provided right, through Warrior Concepts programs. So it, along with my weekly Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday, I know some of you guys uh, follow that. That's uh, It's simulcast, right? So that we, we've got these things popping up in multiple places. Some of you are listening in on my uh, personal uh, Facebook page. Some of you are listening in uh, on uh, the Kuden podcast page. When it comes to Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday, right, it doesn't show up on the Kuden page. It shows up on the online uh, Needs to Training Facebook page. Uh, both of them show up at the same time on YouTube, right? Uh, they're also simulcast to Twitter, right? So, <clears throat> but uh, this is an integral part, right? So this, this show covers two of the three aspects of the historical training framework. Right? And there's a reason I'm mentioning this at the moment because this plays into what I'm going to be talking about here uh, in a bit based on, again, this email that I sent out to my subscriber list. So if you're on that, then you're going to know what I'm talking about because you've, you have, right? You have opened and read uh, that email already. So you kind of have a heads up on things, right? Uh, but for those of you who are not on the list, why the hell not, right? Um, then, uh, then, then those will be a first for you, right? But when I when I say this, this makes up two of the three aspects of historical training, right? That framework, right? Taiden, which is the physical training, right? Tai's body. Den means transmission, okay? Um, kind of like when we say minkyo kaiden, right? Somebody has full and complete transmission of the information, at least in the scrolls and the densho of any given lineage. Uh, but Taiden is the physical transmission. So, uh, you know, that, that's what most people think of, right? They think of being in the dojo or they think of being in an online program, maybe Zoom calls or maybe they just have DVDs or whatever it is. And <clears throat> so they're watching their, well, <laughs> sometimes, most of the time, they're watching the teacher demonstrate a technique and then they're going about doing things. Teacher comes along, you know, corrects things and whatnot. And other times, uh, they're the uke, right? They're the training partner helping the teacher demonstrate that technique. Um, they learn the technique in a very different way, um, in a very important way, right? But there's the taiden, there's the kuden, hence the name of this uh, podcast. Kuden is the transmission of knowledge, Right? And generally speaking, most people translate that uh, almost verbatim, right? So this is the, the knowledge side of things. And, uh, you know, it's lecture stuff, that kind of thing, right? But kuden is also a term that's used to represent this transmission from teacher to student. It's almost like the, uh, it, can, it can also be the oral uh, transmission, right? So, uh, you know, every time uh, I ever hosted a seminar and um, I had my teacher in town instead of me going to a seminar, uh, sometimes it happened then as well, but when I had him in town, um, the benefit of having, of hosting a seminar, right? For those of you who have done it, you know, the benefit of hosting a seminar is it's, it's kind of like if, you know, Muhammad can't go to the mountain, you bring the mountain to Muhammad. But it goes way beyond that, right? It goes way beyond the parameters or the, or the, the, the boundaries, right, of, uh, of the seminar itself, right? Because the host and sometimes, you know, some of the extra students and whatnot that are helping, um, they get a lot of extra time with the teacher. Right. And it's not like it's wired in. I mean, it, it is, but it's not like it's, oh, you know, we're, we're going to do a special training here with the teacher that nobody else gets to see. No, this is incidental, but critical. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I had to pick up my teacher from the airport, an hour and a half drive to uh, to my place. Right. Had to drive him back to the airport after the seminar was was finished. Right. There's another hour and a half. Right. Uh, I had to make sure he was uh, he was fed. So breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, sometimes dinner was at my house. Sometimes it was a restaurant, uh, whatever. Right. 
uh, and then there were all these extra times, as, as one of my teachers used to say, you know, at the end of the seminar, at the end of, at the end of dinner, you know, I'm just, I'm not just going back to the, to the hotel and, you know, twiddling my thumbs or staring at TV or whatever, right? This gives us time to discuss your training. So there were a lot of extra hours. And I, I do things very much the same way that my teacher did as well, right? Uh, that gave lots of extra time for either me to ask questions and him to answer, or we would just be chatting about things that were just happening, right? Uh, my students understand this. We used to, be, before the, the time slots got too packed uh, at the dojo, and it, this still happened at uh, Someo Sensei's uh, dojo, private dojo, not at Hombu. Um, and in, in other contexts, uh, Shrey Sensei would do the same thing. He would just take these bigger breaks in the middle of class. But uh, sometimes he, you know, weather was inclement, he would uh, drive us back to the train station instead of just having us walk or take a taxi or whatever. But this is extra time to discuss things. And so it, there's this teacher to student kind of thing, right? Where we could be discussing things on the scrolls. We could be discussing history, but more often than not, we were discussing either some happening from class or some kind of drama that was going on in the world or whatever. And he would relate that to these lessons, right? So, uh, you know, here's what the past masters would say about things, but here's a good opportunity to look at how the same problem is going on in the world as was going on hundreds of years ago, but it looks different, but we need to be able to see beyond the surface, right? He would talk about, um, you know, the importance of being able to understand the principles and concepts that are being conveyed um, beyond what the technique looks like or what the, what the lesson sounds like, right? Or what Japanese or whatever words are being used or whatever, because if we can't do that, then we can't apply it uh, in today's world. So again, here we are with that traditional, modern, uh, which, which side, right? Um, but, uh, and while that has an element of the personal bonding kind of thing, um, there's also this other element, right? Shinden, right? The heart-to-heart -heart transmission, which I'm, I'm not going to, dive into this as much as I, I deal with the other ones, but this is that personal bond that the teacher and student have that's not the same if somebody is only a seminar student or they are only doing DVD training or whatever. There's nothing wrong with those, those different formats of training. I mean, I certainly did those. I did DVD training before stuff was on DVDs. Anyway, um, <laughs> so... Uh, but there are these three aspects to training, right? And Kuden, Kuden, the, the show, right, helps with both those knowledge-based lessons, but it also crosses over into the Shinden realm because we're talking about life stuff, right? We're, we're going past the martial to the struggles of life, <coughs> personal uh, characteristics, producing results, uh, goal attainment, those kind of things, right? And it, it's all related. This is all part of the same uh, body of knowledge because challenges are challenge, challenges, conflicts are conflicts. Sometimes it's a knife coming at you. Sometimes it's somebody trying to stab you in the back uh, figuratively, right? Because they're trying to maneuver and take your job or whatever, right? But all three of these things are necessary for the development of what is known as the Tatsujin, right? Tatsujin, the fully actualized warrior, the fully developed human being, right? Um, now, if you look up Tatsujin, sometimes you see it translated this way. Sometimes you see it related to uh, swordsmanship because Tatsujin was also a name at a certain period in Japanese history that was used to reference somebody who was a sword master and i mean like you know like <laughs> we might use the term virtuoso right that they could just do magical shit with a, with a sword okay but what we're looking at is somebody who has gone beyond 
uh, the technical gone beyond, uh, you know, the the thing that most people set their sights on being great at. Okay, uh, but the way it was introduced to me in the context of this art is this idea of this fully actualized human being. Right, we, we're firing on all all cylinders. Right, there are so many different aspects of ourselves. There are so many things that we could uh, we could hone, we could develop. Uh, those kind of things, right? So right, let me just do a, a technical check here to make sure that, that we're still good. James, we, we still good? Yeah, everything's good? Okay, awesome. Sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of following along with my outline here because I didn't want to miss anything. So uh, moving forward, right, this is our goal, right? This is our goal. One... The goal is to be true to ourselves, right? And I'm going to be covering this in our next episode, this idea of authenticity, right? Um, this is something that is uh, embedded in Ninpo, right? It's the concept of seishin, right? Personal development, personal clarity, understanding, knowledge, right? My dog thinks that he needs to guard me. Anyway, uh, so... Uh, but it's, it's a huge part of Mikyo, of course, this underpinned, uh, underpinning, right? The philosophy and everything that, that comes behind, uh, behind everything, right? Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later, right? But it's, it's the Seishin, right? Is one of the eight core fundamentals from the Gyoko school uh, of warriorship, right? One of our nine lineages um, that our... What I would say is our best, we we'll use the term, because I, I across multiple realms, right? Our best clients, our best students, right? Need to continually work on and develop to get where they want to go, right? And to make every effort to get out in front, right? This is this is the goal to get to get to make every effort to get out in front of those what i would call perfect students and i don't mean they're perfect as far as being a person or whatever but what makes them ideal is that they're not just looking for punching kicking whatever right that's a part of it but they're looking for a lot more right they're looking for all the stuff that was passed down okay right? because ultimately like i said challenges are challenges conflict is conflict right there's lots more that pops up, especially in the Western world, right? Unless you live in an inner city drive-by zone and whatnot, you're probably not in a filter physical altercation on a regular basis, right? The, the world, our world is not like that, but emotional things, pushy salesmen, people trying to browbeat you to buy into their ideology or else or whatever. That shit happens all the time, right? So, um, I'm looking for these ideal people because they're like the best ones that I and we have already attracted, right? And continue to attract, right? So uh, just off the top of my head, right? People like uh, Michael, right? I got a former world Taekwondo champion, right? This guy won, I think it was in, was it in Portugal or Spain. Either way, it was in 2010, right? contacts me out of the blue is binge listen to uh, all the Kuden uh, podcast episodes and whatnot and wants to take things to a different not even a new level but into a different realm right uh, I got a guy local guy at my at my dojo uh, his name is Fred right he's a retired psychiatrist right uh, Christina right she's a former engineer turned holistic ho uh, health co uh, consultant and coach uh, Carl, I talk about him all the time, right? He's a police officer and a student. Um, and when I when I say student, Carl has <laughs> he's been a student of more combat oriented self defense systems than I can remember, right? Uh, he's in Australia, right? Uh, Terrence, a real estate investor, Lee's a school teacher and a wilderness survival expert. As a matter of fact, Lee was on the panel uh, last week, right? But the list goes on. Um, and again, for anybody that I might have missed, right? Don't get ruffled, right? Um, it just th there's a lot, right? Um, and I want to take up the, the the episode with all this, but um, the the here here's the thing, right? What do all of these students have in common? Okay? That's the question. What do they all have in common? Right? And the question 
or the, the answer is that um, they're all focused on this broader, uh, this broader um, focus, right? Focused on broader focus. That didn't even make sense. They're focused on this broader sphere, right? They're focused on both self-defense and personal development. And they're really smart people who will call me on my bullshit if something doesn't sound legit. Right? I mean, I've got past fighter champions. I've got, uh, you know, law enforcement, military, security, uh, people with really, really freaking high college degrees, psychiatrists, right? Um, that uh, smart folks. I mean, I, all the people that I attract right, tend to be um, in that realm. Okay. So, anyway, so with the exception of those who are local and got involved that way, right? Because they, they're just li living close to the dojo. So I was one of the phone calls they made, right? The rest found me online, articles, videos, through formats like this, right? Whiteboard Wednesday, webinars that I've done. Um, in fact, most of the best long distance students have said that they've binged watched or binged listened to nearly every episode, right? Uh, of this, of Whiteboard Wednesday, watched, you know, YouTube videos and all that before they reached out to learn how they can work with me how they can work with warrior concepts, right? So we're also finding at the dojo, right? I was just talking to James before uh, the the episode started. Uh, I had just got off the phone with a mom who called about her high school uh, daughter uh, about getting her into classes and things like that. <coughs> and uh, we just had a 10 year old, right? Parents brought him in really bad victim of bullying. And um, what we're finding is that more and more of these folks, including these two that I just mentioned, um, before they call or stop in, right, adults and kids, right, they've all decided that we were, we were the right fit before they made contact, right, because they bounced into this stuff, right? The mom tonight told me she watched multiple videos and all that. So um, for those who, you know, like to attack things, and I know that you guys are not, not, not that, Right. But a, a, a lot of you have reached out and said, you know, man, you get my vote or kudos or whatever, because, you know, of all the shit you take from these people. It's the nature of the beast. Right. When and you'll, you'll find this as well, the more you really make radical changes to your life and you step into that realm of that Tatsu gene. Um, the monsters really come out of the woodwork. Right. And this is not me lamenting. This is just this is just a cautionary warning that uh, you need to be prepared for that. And sometimes they have faces of people that used to be friends. Okay? And so the, the decision gets harder and harder because you have to decide whether or not you're staying the path. Again, that's for another episode. But that being said, <coughs> excuse me, beginning with this episode, we're going to be making sure that everyone knows how to connect more, not just to the lessons, but to me right? To us. Okay. So let's do this, right? I've talked enough about that part, eating up enough uh, time with that. So let's do this. Let's jump into the email that I sent to my subscribers this past week. Um, the one that was titled when traditional was modern, right? And I knew that that was going to sound confusing to some people, but um, that's why I did it. Okay. Because I truly don't think a lot of people, uh, even those focused, especially those focused on traditional, right? Um, that they that they that they get this thing that we need to talk about, okay? And before we do that, let me just say that when it comes to needed to, I am definitely a traditionalist. And for those of you that are on audio only, maybe you can hear that my voice has changed because I've got this sneaky cat smile on my face. Okay. Um, I am a traditionalist, but not the way most people think. Okay. Um, one of my teachers a long, long time ago said that, uh, not wearing Hakama, Dogi, 
all kinds of things that we, you know, I wear every once in a while these days. We wear martial arts uniforms and, and those kind of things, right? But as ninja, wearing these things or carrying ourselves a certain way or uh, only focusing on certain parts of training and whatnot, right? By not doing those things, that in and of itself is one of the most traditional things that we could do. Because we have to remember that, you know, in the history books, when you read this stuff, right, the ninja are often uh, identified as, as this counterculture to the samurai ruling class, right? But that doesn't mean that they were like street urchins and stuff like that. Oh, no, sensei, they were, they were farmers. Really? Well, those farmers owned castles and shit like that, right? Could they be living and working as? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, but it wasn't that, it wasn't that simple. Right? What what we're talking about with the counterculture is that the predominant culture was one of not just ancestor worship, because the, the ninja families had that kind of thing as well. And it wasn't, I don't know, worship is a bad word for a lot of modern people, especially people that see themselves as agnostic or atheist, because they, they only associate one a word with one thing, right? But the, you'd have to understand the Asian mind in this connection with ancestors, right? And a constant state of gratitude for them passing down the knowledge and, and whatnot, right? And of course, there's a belief that they still oversee them and whatnot. I'm not going into those realms, right? But um, the samurai way of thinking, typically, right, was in, if it was good enough for great grandpappy, it was great enough for his dad, if it was great and good enough for his dad, and whatever, then it's, it's certainly good enough for me, right? It was to hold to the tradition, right? Um, even in modern Japan, there's this idea that um, there are certain things that make Japanese people Japanese people, okay? Just like in the U.S., there are certain things that make uh, Americans, Americans, right? I know that there's North America, South America, and lots of people are Americans, but you get the idea, right? Uh, same thing with British, Scottish, German, whatever, okay? And that's not not true. But there was this, this attempt to hold on to, right? Where the ninja, as a counterculture, were, were all about technology, right? If there were things being imported or there were new things that could allow for them to accomplish things better, faster, uh, whatever. They were all about that, okay? So, for instance, when the Tanakashima, right, the firearm came in, um, and <laughs> I'm, I'm going to save you a little bit of time. If you get, try to go translate the word Tanakashima and, and figure out how that how they even came up with that word for, for firearm or flintlock or whatever, um, save yourself the time. Okay? Tanegashima was the port that um, that the uh, foreigners landed at, and that's the first port where these flintlocks, uh, these basically basically there were arkmuses that came in, and uh, so they just gave it the name Tanegashima. So, um, and while Oda Nobunaga and some other lords of the time used these things during the Sengoku Jidai Warring States period, um, they actually didn't last very long uh, because it was too easy to kill trained right warriors, right? And these people had, uh, then they had uh, family lines of a thousand years or more, right? And so it just seemed like it was kind of a dishonorable thing. So uh, more often than not, they set them aside or they gave them to untrained people that they recruited Right out of villages uh, to uh, to help fight their battles, um, but the ninja held on to these things. Right? Yeah, no, no, no. This is this is a good thing. Right? This allows somebody who's who's uh, the underdog, right, to neutralize that advantage that the other person has. Right? And so, <clears throat> anyway, <coughs> excuse me. The weather's changing and my allergies are kicking back up again. So anyway, um, 
uh, again, when we're looking at this idea of traditional, right? Um, we need to ask ourselves, what does this mean? Okay. So what the, the gist of the, of the article in the email that I sent out was, was that the things that we see as traditional, right? That we call traditional. I only want to do traditional training, right? Um, during the Sengoku Jirai Warring States period, which is, this, this is going to be important, right? Uh, as we talk about this stuff moving forward. Um, this was the technology. This was the modern stuff. Okay, They had their own traditional, they had their own uh, old ways, right? That they thought of as old school, right? But this was the modern the modern technology of the day based on weapons, based on armor, that kind of stuff, right? So I, I get the studying of old ways, okay? I get that, right? Um, keiko, right? Uh, sometimes your gi is called keikogi, right? Ke not keigogi, which is Korean for dog meat. Anyway, um, keiko, right? Old ways, right? So, uh, or the study of old ways. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is in missing the, the reason why this was the way it was. Okay. So anyway, if, for those of you, you know, are on the list, you can read exactly what I wrote or whatever, but, um, this kind of coincides with, uh, one of my inner circle uh, coaching calls that I have weekly with my, with my guys in, in that program. And, um, one of my guys, Josh, who's been in a whole bunch of different martial arts, he's been in sport and whatever. And, you know, he's been doing this with me for quite a while. Um, but Josh asked a question during this, one of these most previous coaching calls, I think it was Friday morning, maybe, um, about whether or not I thought ninjutsu would have developed the same way that it did if it were invented today. And I said, no. Okay. And the reason for that is because things are different. All right. I'll give you for instance, in ancient Japan, um, let me switch my gears over here. In ancient Japan, when, if let's say we lived back in 13th, 14th, 15th century Japan, right? And we had to do uh, some stealth work, right? We're in the Sengoku Jidai Warring States period. And we're doing a spy mission. We're information gathering, right? The only things that we had to worry about were the eyes and ears of human beings and the eyes, ears, and noses of dogs that were used to help with guarding places. Okay. That's hard enough. In today's world, we have motion sensors. We have pressure plates. We have infrared. We have uh, all kinds of things, right? Uh, so... Our stealth skills and abilities have to be much better than our ninja ancestors. Okay? But we have other technology, right? I can I can surveil somebody um, without leaving my home because this thing has an app on it that's wired to all of the cameras mounted around my house outside i have a full perimeter with audio what that means is i can hear what somebody's saying and i can also flip a switch and talk to them through the cameras not just one not just the front door and back door okay all the way around my house okay so surveillance and information gathering that's different right there are services I can sign up to online, right? 
all I need is a phone number to start with and somebody's full name. And for all the stuff that people try to guard, like their social security number and all that, I don't need that. I want that as a private investigator. Okay. If I know a past residence where they lived, right? I can do the rest. Okay. The amount of information that Facebook knows about every single one of us that, that use it. I don't use Facebook. I use, well, <laughs> okay, fantastic. Right. But um, so information gathering is way different. Right? And I truly do believe that the past masters, right, would not have done what a lot of quote unquote traditionalists are doing today by just completely dismissing new stuff because this is the way we've always done it, right? This is the traditional way to do it. Right? Well, great. I truly do believe that they lived in today's world. They would not have hand copied. Now, there's a lot to be said for doing it. And this goes on the Mikyo side with the monks as well. There's a lot to be said about it because of neuro wiring and things like that. But I truly do believe that they wouldn't have sat in a room hand copying scrolls from one to another or to make copies. And this goes for the West as well, right? In the, uh, in the, in the monasteries, right? Uh, Christian monasteries. The room full of monks, right? With a master copy of a Bible or they'd each have one that was done before them and their job was to make a new one, right? Human Xerox machines. But I truly do believe that they had Xerox machines, right? They would have done that, okay? Prior to the invention of the Gutenberg press, right? Things were all done that way by hand. Once that was done, the amount of books that were published and the amount of Bibles, and it was it was actually done to produce the Bible faster, right? Um, just happened way way faster. So, no, I don't I don't think that it would have developed the same way. But beyond skill sets, right? Our types wouldn't look the same. And here's how I know that, okay? Right? So I have weird hobbies. Our Tajitsu, right, is based on fighting and danger considerations that existed during the Sengoku Jedi Warring States period. And I don't just mean armor. I mean the prevalence of bladed weapons. Okay? Nearly everyone was carrying a 26 to 36 inch razor blade, or they were carrying a eight to 16 inch, 18 inch blade on the end of a pole whether it was a spear or a halberd or whatever, okay? So, so was I. Yeah. But see, if we follow history and we move into the Edo period all the way up to today's world, and we're just looking at Japanese martial arts, what we see is that as weapons became less prevalent, because remember, once Iyasu Tokugawa, Right, took over, and the whole Tokugawa family had that hundred years of peace, hundred years of enforced peace. Right, weapons became less and less allowed, less and less prevalent. Right, what we see historically, traditionally, is that kamai. became higher, right? They weren't so low. The feet came closer together and the torso went from almost completely profiled to more square forward, just like you see in Western pugilism, where it was more nose to nose, eye to eye, toe to toe, right? Why? Weapons, bladed weapons, okay? Just like the Bible says, this is not a biblical thing, but it's a good quote, right? The wages of sin are death, okay? What's a sin, right? I know people have lots of definitions for it, but sin first showed up in, in the book of Romans, okay? Romans is all about amassing an army to protect, defend, and or, okay? And so sin is an old archer's term. It means to miss your mark, 
Okay? And if an archer missed his mark often enough, he was going to die. Because the other guy's going to get in on you. Okay? So the consequences of bad taijutsu during that era was death because even a even a narrow you know even a glancing shot was going to open you up okay? or a part of your body was going to fall off okay um, if you understand the transition in armor right because originally armor I mean, we would think, well, that's stupid. It's, it, it looks like inverted grass baskets on somebody's body. Yeah, but the metallurgy was off. And so the, the dachi, the big battlefield swords of the time, weren't nearly as sharp as a katana, right? When the katana came in, that armor went out, right? But you also the, had these ideas during that time period, right, where karma's a bitch, man, right? If you get tagged, Right? then you deserve to die, okay? But they also believe in karma as in like reincarnation, rebirth kind of stuff, right? So cosmic do-over. Anyway, um, so what you see is armor changing, but it, that's where that turtle, what I call turtle shell or armadillo kind of look started to come in where things kind of overlap everything else. <coughs> and so if you took a full-on shot or a stab or whatever from a katana, it'd go right through your armor. But the armor wasn't designed to protect you from things like that, okay? Like a lot of people think of European armor. It wasn't designed that way. It was designed to protect you against near misses, okay? So there's leeway, right? But a full-on shot? Yeah, well, okay? So, but if if that's the problem, that my, my shit needs to be together, okay? But as that becomes less and less prevalent and we become more of a fisticuff kind of thing or judo or jujitsu like things or whatever, where, yes, you could still die. Yes, you could still get maimed, whatever. But it becomes less and less, right? Because more about winning and losing face than it becomes about you're not going home ever, right? So the consequences get lower right so in today's world right um i i don't think that most people would consider and most people don't right if you if you look at the comments on most of our videos most of the comments on most people's videos right people calling foul bullshit or whatever right everybody knows how to fight for those of you on audio only i just made air quotes right everybody knows how fighting is done um yeah why? Well, because that's how everybody in their realm does it, okay? And because they haven't had somebody start out wrestling or, you know, fist fighting or whatever, and next thing you know, a gun or a knife comes into play. Well, you know, because that's not fair. Well, this is not about fair. This is about warfare, okay? It's spelled differently, okay? So um, what, we need to, what we need to understand is... The idea of the why, right? The kotsu of your techniques. Kotsu, right? This means essence, right? Or essential nature, okay? Not kotsu like bone or like uh, the sternum, right? It's also called kotsu, okay? Um, it's, it's the essential nature, right? What? What are we talking about? What's being conveyed? Okay. And so here's how I take it. And here's why I say that I'm a traditionalist. But I'm a traditionalist in the sense of understanding the lessons properly, the old ways, so that I can properly apply them in a modern context. I'm not looking to change the art, right? This art has survived hundreds, thousands of years, okay? Not looking to change it. What I need to do is understand how and what 
what kind of thinking went into these old ways and how do I apply this against the modern attacker? The environment's different. The terrain is different, right? Weaponry is different, right? But after I, I, I stay focused on Sengoku Jidai warring states period, right? And this is why this is important, right? Remember the consequences of error was death, okay? Because of the blades, okay? So if I train based on that mentality, then what I am doing is training to handle the worst possible situation that can pop up in today's world, okay? including guns, okay? because I need to understand the use of cover. I need to understand the use. And this is where we cross over into need to cover concealment, that kind of stuff. I'm not just going to go charging blindly um, into things. Right. So if I can handle the worst case scenarios, then everything else is already handled. I'm not saying that it's easy, right? You know, fist fights are easy. No, they're not easy, right? But compared to somebody coming at me with a machete or a hatchet or a katana, wing nuts have done that in the world, right? Um the consequences of error is not the same, okay? So if I aim here, right, then everything where the consequences are less by comparison, it's already covered, right? I don't have to think about how to change my movement because the conditions changed. I'm not talking about rolling instead of. I'm not talking about doing yokoruki because of the the, the way the ground is or whatever. I'm talking about my standard way of moving my body. Okay? But the person who fights nose to nose, toe to toe or whatever, right? Who's never considered that that fist fight can turn into a knife fight, but they forgot to bring one or a gun can come into play or whatever. And they, they absolutely would need to profile their body the chances of them doing that, it's really slim, right? So here's the thing. I don't, I don't, I don't buy into these arguments. I don't play these games um, when it comes to traditional versus modern. Okay? There's a reason that things have lasted for as long as they have. But there's also a reason that they started the way they started. And that goes for everything, including sport, martial arts, all that stuff. Right? So what we have to understand, because ultimately we do have to apply this stuff in a modern context. Right? You have no choice. Right? You don't have a time machine. Right? And besides that, would you want to go back? I know a lot of people fantasize it, but would you really want to go back there? Right? It's kind of like the time that my, I, I did a presentation in Dublin, Ireland. And... Um, <laughs> As soon as I got the uh, the uh, acceptance for my uh, my abstract for my proposal to do this uh, talk at a major medical conference, I was over there, and um, as soon as I got it, my wife <laughs> my wife said, "There's no way in hell you're going to Ireland without me." And then she bought the plane tickets, so I <laughs> so she, she she couldn't not not go right. So anyway. Um, there was plenty of time that we wired in on either side of the trip and we found a Viking museum. It was just pure accident. We had no idea that it was around. Right. And so we go in and the first part of it's very much open, like your typical museum and there's shields and swords and armor and, you know, things about the way people lived and all that. But then as you got back farther into the building, the building itself became the display, right? They had a, well, it wasn't, nobody was alive, but it was a, two scale diorama of like a, a little, not a village, but like a small town. And so you wound through these little streets and they, it, it was inside. So it was more dark, but more like there was, there was uh, overhangs and cover and all that. And um, the things that you learn, right? 
um, you know, the prevalence of dysentery and they didn't have tetanus shots. So if you cut yourself on a rusty piece of metal, you were probably going to die a horrible death of lockjaw. Um, but the, you know, the development of overcoats and top hats and whatnot, because, you know, piss buckets were a thing. They didn't have running water and whatnot, right? People threw that stuff out of their second floor, second, third story window onto the streets. So that's where galoshes and all this kind of stuff came from, right? Uh, but then, the, you know, combs, right? And made their hair nice and straight and made it look nice. But more often than not, people carried combs to keep the lice in their hair at bay. Okay. Um, same thing with perfumes and the wealthy wearing layers upon layers upon layers of clothing, even when it was warm. What gives? No deodorant. Okay. All the stuff that we take for granted, right? So as one of my teachers used to say, do you really, do you really want to go back there? So, um, but ultimately we have this modern context that we need to, we need to, to handle, right? We need to be able to do things in, but if we're ignorant of history, then, and, and I get this, if you're ignorant of history, you're bound to repeat it. Yeah, not necessarily. Okay. Um, you'll make the same mistakes that people made and learned from, you know, people these days, right? This, this is a social construct and, you know, it's all, it was all made up. It's a social construct. We're not going to buy into it. Shit. Let's just take that to its fullest extent. Right, James? Talked about that earlier. Just take it to its full extent. You're right. It's a social construct, right? I, I support your your belief that you should run around naked, shit in your backyard, and not wipe. Because that social construct was developed certain things over time so that human beings could last longer. And I know what people are talking about, but you know what? Let's just throw it all out, right? There's none of these problems that exist in the world because it's a social construct. A social construct is make-believe. No, this shit happened, right? So anyway, um, <clears throat> so traditional or modern? Well, okay. What worked? Why was it developed? Okay. So again, if I train based on the idea that a blade or a stick or a pole or whatever could come into play at any moment, Right? then I'm going to manage things much differently. Right? If I recognize that not all fights, okay? speaking of which, I, <laughs> people, that, people that make their dumbass comments slay me. James, what's one, what's one of the most um, common comments on our videos when it comes to like wrist grab defenses or uh, clothing grabs or whatever? It's one of the most common. That nobody ever does that in a fight. Nobody ever does that. Yeah, so um, as an ex-cop, I call bullshit. But um, there, it shows up many different ways, right? I can't remember a time I've ever grabbed anybody in a fight. I can't remember a time anybody's ever grabbed me in a fight. Nobody does that. That's bullshit. Right. What's our run on wrist grabs this week? You know, all kinds of bullshit comments. Right. Well, I just had a comment um, posted. I don't know if it was last week or whatever. Um, one of the guys uh, on my subscriber list uh, apparently used to be a member of maybe Chicago branch of Hell's Angels. And he said they absolutely do grab. Yeah, of course they do. Right. I'm an ex-federal cop. I've seen my fair share of people grabbing. I've had to put my hands on people. They put tried to put their hands on me. All kinds of things. Absolutely, it does happen, right? But I've talked about this before. Our belief system limits and puts a ceiling on whatever we're going to be doing. But we've got one side that's only going to be doing modern ninjutsu, right? Because they're going to... They tell me they're going to be adapting everything to modern fighting. But what I end up seeing is their skill set completely changes so they're fighting like everybody else. Okay? And some people are leaning over on the traditional side 
I only to do it the traditional way, but they're not doing any, and they're not understanding how to use that and how that traditional stuff neutralizes or seriously hampers uh, different types of attackers from being able to do their stuff, right? Boxers and their jabs, uh, Taekwondo and kickboxers from doing their front snap kicks or their roundhouse kicks or whatever, right? So it's not an either or, and it never has been, right? From a ninja's perspective, it never has been, okay? Ninjutsu has always been based on understanding the worst possible scenarios, understanding the, the problems where you're going to be outgunned, right? You're going to be at a serious disadvantage. And here's the technology for neutralizing that, for bringing things to at least zero so that you can move forward and take care of it, right? Um, at least based on the way I've been taught for over four decades, um, that's the gist. Now, is that the gist in today's world? I don't know. All I know is that when I got started in 1980, that was the gist. Okay. Um, and from what I've been told by old school teachers who are now, some of them are so okay, some of them are just senior Daishihan and whatnot, um, that goes back into the 70s and late 60s. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it, it always is about applying things in a modern context, but that doesn't mean that modern ninjutsu needs to look different, right? Um, or that we need to play the same game, okay? But also following the path of traditional ninjutsu, traditional bujutsu. Right? It doesn't mean that we throw away the tactics and the strategies designed for kill shots. Right? I don't know if we talked about this in Kudan. I've, I've got so many classes that I do every week that I'm, I'm not sure that I, I hit on these. But um, a lot of people, uh, starting in probably the mid '80s, '86 maybe something like that, '86, '87, um, these, these kata lists started coming out, and so people got these things, and they were they were translations, right, of what's on the scrolls. Right? People assume that if they got them, then they would have all the magic. No, what you have is a is a rough translation in your language of the crib notes, right, of the summarization key points of these techniques. But what you don't have is the makimono, the scrolls that have all of the principles, concepts, all the stuff that drives those kata, which is why everybody does the kata from all the lineages pretty much the same, right? Um, but typically what you see is uke ski, uke grabs, okay, kick, whatever, right? But it doesn't say how. It doesn't say what occurred before that moment in time. It doesn't, there's so much that's not there, right? So, uh, anyway. Uh, but the gist of all this is that we need to get our head wrapped around what's there, right? And again, Taiden, Kuden, Shinden. Right? You can learn all the techniques, but that doesn't mean that you understand the art. It goes for me too. Right? Um, just like I just heard something recently right? um, about uh, people wanting things changed so that they can attain... Uh, equality. And I think it had to do with education, right? They wanted standards changed. Again, this goes back to the to the uh, the social construct, right? The standards are unfair. I want that, so you need to change things so I can feel equal. Okay. Well, 
you still won't be equal even if you get what you wanted because the standards changed you didn't rise to the standards okay it doesn't make you equal okay makes you a kid that stopped screaming when mom gave you the cookie so she didn't have to listen to you scream and i blame the mom who gives the cookie that's why anyway so uh the, the the understanding falls to us right and again this is why this is why this is a realm that most people don't go into right um they think they go into it, but what they're doing is running around the internet or reading a couple of pieces here, or they overhear a conversation by somebody, and then they just go around parroting that thing. That's not the same as understanding, right? Memorizing a quote, like Atsumi sends a quote on the on the, the web or a quote in the Bible or whatever, and then just using that is not the same as understanding, right? The thinking processes that produce that way of communicating so anyway traditional or modern yes okay. and no right because in today's world when it comes to stealth i'm going to start with the principles and concepts based on you know the old stuff which was actually based on shape and sound shape and sound okay i needed to break up my shape so that eyes couldn't detect it or it couldn't be detected as a human being right smell was a big part as well right because if you smell like a human being then the dog's gonna come and bite you in the ass right but also sound okay but you can eliminate you can change your shape and you can eliminate sound but you still have pressure plates you still have motion detectors you still have infrared you still have uh heat sensors, all kinds of stuff, right? So in today's world, I use that to start, and then I'm going to have to ramp it up. In other realms, like hand-to-hand, -hand, you know, I know how people do things, okay? But I'm going to trust the stuff that was developed in the single Jedi Warring States period. One, because Modern fighters aren't going to know what the hell they're dealing with, and most of them don't. Take up an Ichimonji, right? Oh, and by the way, I have a meme that's coming out in the next day or two. Okay? It says, say Ichimonji one more time. Ichimonji. <laughs> anyway, so, and those who say Ichimonji, right, um, don't know what I just meant. <laughs> Anyway, so um, the uh, yeah, uh, ev everybody that I've ever sparred with that fights modern conventionally, right? As soon as they take up an Ichimonji, and maybe you've experienced this as well. First thing they want to point out is that the arm can be grabbed or hit, and the leg can be swept. You're absolutely right. If I don't know how to properly use an Ichimonji. because it's not what it looks like. Okay. That's, that's why it took me years to figure out what Hatsumi Sitsei meant when he said, if you don't know how to do Ichimonji, you can't do Taijutsu. Most people go, <laughs> Ichimonji? Yeah. Okay. That's not what he meant. Okay. And he also said, if you can't do Yokoruki, you can't do Henka. Okay. Pretty broad statements. But... They're not going to know what they're looking at. They have to figure things out on the fly because they've never dealt with it before. And two, I don't have to change my fight style if this guy grabs a weapon or whatever and I need to be positioned and, and my body needs to be in a certain uh, setup or a certain way based on that thing. Because at its core, our fight system was developed to handle those worst case scenarios. And just like it's easier for a civilized man to act like a barbarian than it is for a barbarian to act like a civilized man, it's easier for somebody 
who is trained to handle worst case scenarios, to handle more mundane things than it is for somebody who handles the mundane or is trained for the mundane to be able to handle the scary shit. Okay. Anyway, that's that's what I have. We didn't go very very long. We'll see what kind of questions and whatnot pop up. But what do we have, James? James is the surrogate voice for everyone else. I'm glad that everybody's voice sounds that deep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me get back here. Dale Burkett Jr. said, thank you for doing these live broadcasts. It's amazing how your life stories apply to so many different things in life. Hmm. You're welcome. Like I said at the very beginning, it's either here to be helpful or it's because James and I have nothing else to do in our lives. Trust me, we have plenty. Right? <laughs> uh. Tories on and said, asked at some point, could you address the topic of people who have been out of training for some time? Just your thoughts and recommendations. That's too vague, Tori. I need more, more specific. Are we talking about getting back into it? I mean, I'll deal with it right now if, if you can be more specific. Are we talking about getting back into it? Are we talking about where to start? Um, wh what are we talking about? Because you know what? That is the biggest thing that people send me either they either send that's a part of the message when they make contact would you agree james they want to get back into training mm -hmm. and whatnot they've been out for a decade three decades 500 years whatever right or um they have but they just can't get the motivation that there's all these things right um so if i don't have a specific because here's a, here's a, an example if you're like my friend lee who was training when he was let's say 12 to 17 okay he was a kid his parents signed him up for the dojo it was fairly close to their home and whatnot right and then he went to the military spent years didn't do any of this, right? Other than what he had learned and kind of, you know, stayed in practice a little bit, right? And then got out and then experienced something different than what he had trained before because everything, not everything, right? Everything that he kept bumping into was different. And then he's married, right? And now I've got, you know, wife, I've got family, I got job to work around there for the longest time he had military duty to work around all that kind of stuff right if he is trying to get back into training now he's back in training but if he's trying to get back in training because of life pulling him in multiple directions that's different from here's an example somebody telling me they really want to do this but their wife won't let them that's very different from somebody who wants to get back into things, but it's 20 years later and their body's not what it used to be. And that's different. For, you get the idea. So I need specifics because without knowing your context, I, I'd just be throwing jello against the wall as, and hoping it would stick as a piece of artwork. And you and I both know that's not going to work. I'm just going to have a big old stain on the wall and a bunch of freaking jello I got to clean up off the floor. <clears throat> and from <laughs> back when you were naming off some of the uh, long distance students and you mentioned if you missed anybody, <clears throat> Victor said he was ruffled er. <laughs> ruffled er? Yeah. You know, ruffled they invite er. somebody to be on a freaking panel and now they're just going to get wussy on me all the time. Oh. Yeah. Is he cut? Are you all I need to know right now is are you coming to spring camp? That's that's it. That's a good segue. Spring camp, April 26th, 27th, and 28th. Uh, the theme this year is the elements of mastery. So I'm going to be spending quite a bit of time on uh, not just keyhole, but keyhole, no keyhole, fundamentals of the fundamentals, right? Um, 
just past couple of classes. Uh, James, did we did we delve into that on was it last Tuesday's class where we worked on the uh, the Kuki Shinden uh, sword blocking and, and those kind of things? Was that, that was last Tuesday? Yes. Yeah, because the way people were holding the damn sword to start with, right, mm -hmm. was off. The way they were moving their legs, um, and the way they were rotating their torso, all those things, right, were we're not right. Right. Um, so those things are really, really important. Um, of course, we're going to get into the, to the psychological aspects of things uh, and whatnot as well. And then whatever my guest instructors are going to be doing, uh, I don't know, John Golem, I'm sure will whip up something. He just asked me about doing one. So I don't have his, uh, his outline yet, but he's the one that over the past couple of camps that most of you have missed, um, he's done lock picking. He's done, um, what did he do last time? He did like survival stuff, didn't he? Like making traps and right. those kind of things. Pest um, control. Pest control, yes, yes. Pests come in all sizes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right, yeah. Uh, oh, and, and the ruffle or, 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 or uh, yeah, he taught a breakout session or two. It was two. Mm-hmm. Some people just make themselves hard to forget. Not always for the best of reasons. <laughs> just kidding, Victor. <laughs> Put your bandana back on. Anyway. <laughs> what else? Chris McLaurin asked, would the process of man copying and passing down lessons change the lessons just by human error? Not if you're looking at the thing that you're copying and your entire job is just to copy it verbatim. Um, the, the hard part is when you're passing things verbally because memory is volatile. But you also have this idea. And, and th this is a really good question because when we're looking at things, and I, I don't care if we're looking at a video or we're looking at a demonstration the teacher's doing or whatever. Um, I discuss this in class a lot. Um, and this is something that, again, my teacher used to say a lot. And I was like, not, you know, do the nodding. Right. But, and that is that I can't teach you this stuff. It's something you're going to have to learn. Wait, what, how do I learn it if you don't teach it? Well, because I'm demonstrating, I'm using stories to point you in the right direction, that kind of thing. But it's not the same. Even watching a demonstration, I don't. And see, this, what's really funny to me is that people will say that I can't learn from long distance stuff. I can't learn from videos. I have to be in the dojo because dojo is best. Why? Well, because the teacher's right there. Yeah, you know, the teacher's only demonstrating, and then they're talking and explaining. Right? Your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between shit in here that you do, that you visualized and stuff right there. Well, if it can't do that, then how the hell can it tell the difference between a, a demonstration in a room and one that you're watching on a screen? I know that your experience is different, but your perception of the lesson is no different because in either case, you're looking at that demonstration two-dimensionally, which is why every time... I teach lessons and whatnot. I end up demonstrating a technique, what, James, half a dozen times at least, mm -hmm. right? Because every time I do it, we change angle. I change angle because the average student won't fucking move. They stand in one place and watch the demonstration as though they can see all the way around top and bottom. You can't see 90% of a technique from where you're standing. And it doesn't matter if you're looking at a, t at, a, at a computer screen or you're looking at a demonstration in a room. Yeah, but my teacher can correct mistakes. Yeah, well, I can do the same thing through video. I do it on our live Zoom things all the time. And the only thing I can't do is grab you and yank your nary ass into position. But then your muscles would resist that anyway. Okay. So this is where Hatsumi Sensei, the Buddha, <laughs> all smart teachers and mentors 
have used words like this. Ultimately, you have to work this stuff out for yourself. Well, how do you do that? You practice a lot and you run yourself through the experience. So uh, I want to make sure I've covered everything. Uh, repeat uh, Chris's question again. <clears throat> Would the process of man copying and passing down lessons change lessons by just human error? Okay, so you, you always run you always run the the risk of you mistranslating. This isn't just about passing one to another and then it getting changed, like the monks mistranslating the Bible or whatever. They were copying verbatim, okay? It's when things are passed on verbally or you're watching that demonstration or whatever. Because and it, it, before we start worrying about other people mistranslating the lesson, we need to focus on ourselves. And the only way that you can figure it out is it's kind of like being in high school or in the university and being in a science class where you have a classroom setting and you have a lab setting classroom you learn you can pass academic tasks left and right but you go into the lab mix those chemicals together you either get the result you were supposed to get or you don't in either case a question pops up if i get the result that i'm supposed to get because i understood the book work i understood the lecture work then the question is okay what's next but if I don't get it, right, I mix these two chemicals together and it's supposed to turn pink and it's clear or it's black or whatever, right? What's the question? WTF. What the hell did I miss? Right? That's not what the WTF means. You guys know. Anyway, right? So then I'm going to go back. In either case, I'm going to go back to the, to the classroom because I either need to answer the what's next question, get the next lesson, start working on that, or I got to figure out what the hell. Right, because I thought I understood it. Okay, and this is why um, you know we need to pressure test things. This is why, and this is th this is what the teacher is needed for. You keep going back to the source to to get misunderstandings fixed, but we are always at the whim of our limitation of understanding. You will never understand something beyond where you are. Okay. That's why when people are going through Mikyo uh, stuff, right, they think that if they memorize the whole mandala, well, that's it. N no. The mandala have layers. The mandala have connections and dynamics, right? And depending on how you come through and, and whatnot, the, the meanings change, right? Um, the principles and concepts are the same, but it's, it's not the same. <laughs> so... Um, but if I'm, if I, my teacher is giving me a lesson or I'm studying something about the mandala and I, I don't get it, I can't get my head wrapped around it, right? No amount of practicing that technique is going to fix that understanding, right? And it's not that I don't get it, I don't get it, right? It's not about the lesson. There's something that I'm missing in the way I do things, self-knowledge, about the way I understand the movement or the application or the way another human being is going to respond to this thing that I'm doing or whatever, right? There's something that's missing. There's something that's off or there's something that's wrong, which is why as we progress through the upper levels, the process is often more a case of dropping shit than learning stuff, okay? Because we're in our own way. We're trying to translate something based on a, a perspective or a belief system that doesn't allow for that understanding, okay? So what I was always taught is if I'm, if I'm, if I'm hitting this thing and I don't get it, there's something before it that I'm missing. I'll give you another for instance. 
uh, I remember way back when I was prepping for a meet on test because yes, I have been required to test for belts with a with a uh, a very strict level of standard from white belt on. And so I'm, I'm working these these kata, and, and these words came from my teacher's standard, and therefore they are in the black belt packet. Right, study packets for my students. And anybody that is one of my local or long distance students, or you grab the done for you blueprint, right? Which is the five module booklets leading through the five modules from white belt to first degree black belt. And then what's the bonus in that, James? Was it all of the black belt packets or is it just the showdown to need on? Do you remember? There's been both. Okay. Either way, right? So in the black belt, on the black belt cover sheet, there is a statement that says there are, I'm just going to pick one, there are kata referred to as sandan kata. There's no such thing. Right? There's no, <laughs> there's no such thing as sandan kata, right? All the kata in all of the places, right, came from different places on the in, from the scrolls and the lineages, but they're perfect examples of the principles and concepts we're trying to convey at that level. Okay, and for Sandan, it's controlling his perceptions and getting him to do things in a way that serves you. Okay, anything below that, Nidan and below, is all responsive. He does whatever the he wants. And you need to go with the flow. You need to be able to adjust to that and respond. From Sandan and above, it's deeper and deeper levels of control to where he doesn't even know that he doesn't have the control he thinks he has. Cool shit. Anyway, so there are kata referred to as Sandan kata. But and this is this is there. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but these kata are there merely as a way to gauge a student's understanding and ability with the skills and lessons that they're supposed to be embodying, right? Knowing the kata alone is not enough. Well, that just flies in the face of the traditionalist, doesn't it? Okay. Do I want you to know them? Of course, that's the place that you start. But your ability to do it right, at speed is a whole other thing. And your ability to do the kotsu, the essential nature, right? even if what you're doing doesn't look anything like the base model, shihol dori, for example, four directional catching. Yeah, there's a model. Yeah, there are henka. But shihol dori, at its essential nature is I try to, to catch this guy and apply a technique and he counters it and turns that around on me. And I need to counter that and catch him. And right, this thing just goes back and forth, but ultimately it's a, he's countering my technique. I have to be able to counter the counter, but he's going to counter the counter counter. And, but I need to come out, I need to come out on top. Okay. Just doing it two-dimensionally, it's just the place to start. Okay. So volatility of memory, yeah, it's it, it's it's a thing, right? But one, that's why we keep checking with people that know more than we do. And two, until we get, until we have that breakthrough, until we understand what's missing, until, uh, well, let me go back to my story. Testing for knee done. There were a couple of techniques. I just got I kept fucking hitting a wall on it. Just couldn't get it, right? And at a certain point, I just decided, you know what? I'm going all the way back to the beginning. I'm going all the way back to my basic basics, okay? Now, the curriculum I was going through doesn't look exactly like the curriculum that my current students go through, um, and it's because of 
logic and uh, ration, uh, there, there's a certain rationale to the learning process. And there's also a certain thing that I was dealing with, um, <laughs> with quote unquote modern students who won't fucking practice after they leave a certain belt level behind because somehow they get their head wrapped around that those techniques and skills that they learned at that belt level, well, they're past that and they already learned them. Yeah, you learned them at that level of understanding, right? Meanwhile, now you're getting new principles and concepts that are supposed to be overlaid on those to make them better. This goes back to there's no such thing as a sandan kata. There's no such thing as any of these things, right? But there's also no such thing as a beginner technique, an intermediate technique, and an advanced technique. I don't give a shit what anybody tells you. All right? No, there's shoden kata, there's chuden kata. Yeah, yeah, shoden, also known as jodiaku. The kanji does not mean beginner. It's the same kanji in jodan, no komai, high level, right? It goes in the opposite direction. Gyokoryu, jodiaku no maki, churiaku no maki, geiryaku no maki. High, middle, and low. Not beginner, intermediate, and advanced. See? That little piece of up understanding causes people to not pay attention as well as they should be to the first level, the jodiaku no maki, kata, or in the kotoryu, the shoden no maki, sho and jo, it's the same kanji slightly different pronunciation, right? This is where the most important principles and concepts of the lineage are placed. If you know these and lose the scrolls, you should be able to rebuild all, all three levels of scrolls. Anyway, it's just what they told me and I'm just repeating it. Then. That's, not, that's not it. They did tell me, but you figure it out. Anyway, so I went all the way back to the beginning, put my ego on hold, Forgot that I was a Shodan working on Nidan and started working the basics. And what I started realizing was this is the way I learned it and this is what I'm doing. But based on this other stuff that I learned, the angle should be a little bit different. The timing should be a little bit different. Than, right. And I started overlaying that stuff on and two things happened. One, all of my lower level skills got better by nature because now I was doing them like a Shodan, working on Nidan at that level and not the way I learned it. So they all got elevated. And two, I found a couple of errors that were holdovers from lower level work that were still going on. And when I fixed them, so I would work on a bunch of things. I would fix something. I'd go back and work on those things. And I might fix one kata, but the other two are, mm, fuck. Anyway, so I go back and I just, just back and forth, right? Classroom, lab, classroom, lab, classroom, lab, right? And so at a certain point, right, I, I you know, did these things, found these mistakes, right? Made sure I had them correct because I'd work them on different angles and all that. And then I go back and try my knee on kata. And you know what? Shit. Where? I, I couldn't duplicate the mistakes because it wasn't that the kata was the indicator that something was off. Way too many people choose, they like or dislike, choose or dismiss techniques based on whether or not they can do those techniques first off. And I don't mean rough around the edges. I mean, they have a problem with it. I don't like that one. Well, you don't like it because you can't do it. Right? Which means if you ever need something like that, you're not going to be able to do it, which means you'll die. Right? So not being able to do a technique means there's something wrong with my movement, my understanding, right? or my, uh, my attachment to techniques that I learned before it that I didn't fully develop. And now I'm hitting a technique that requires a deeper level understanding in movement, in strategy and tactics and whatnot that I don't have. So I'm going to hit a fucking wall. So this is a constant, constant, constant thing. But again, 
it's easier for ego to chase things down and go, well, somebody mistranslated that Bible. Somebody mistranslated that over there. Somebody's not translating that right over there. Okay, well, what don't you understand? Nothing. I'm all that in a bag of microwave popcorn. That makes me better than everybody else's. You know, better than a bag of chips. It's just, so we always run that risk, but that's why we have a process. And the process is more than teacher demonstrate, grog learn. Really? What is grog learning? Okay. Most grogs want to stop learning when they figure out where to put their foot. In today's class, based again, based on this particular attack, instead of learning where the foot goes to align the body a certain way based on the angle of the incoming attack and the force and pressure being applied by that attacker of a given height, stature, and fight style. See, one's easy. One's too damn hard. I'll call from another statement from the Bible. Okay? Many are called, few are chosen. It has nothing to do with God choosing anybody. The book's open to everybody. Only a few are going to do the work. Okay. This is where people start thinking, man, I haven't heard him pull at his Christian side that much. No. Buddhist. That doesn't preclude me from reading all of the books from other spiritual systems because I can't have a conversation with somebody when I have the understanding of a six-year-old and they've been studying it their entire life. Anyway. All right, what do you got, James? <coughs> Dave said, for me, the traditional is more attached to the rituals, ideology, strategies than to the actual techniques. When people talk about modern, they generally mean techniques only with no traditions. In reality, the people of today don't really attack differently than they have since the caveman. The only real difference is the weapons. People hate and murder and rob the same as they always have. I agree. I agree. What most people see, and you you will have you will have dominating. I'm, I'm gonna use the word style, but I don't mean that. Dominating. Mm, There's like a sense of almost a subliminal, uh, a subliminal effect on people. Okay, you will see people that get in their first fight, and the way they fight looks like fight scenes that they've seen in movies or TV shows. Okay, or uh, if they watch a lot of I don't know who knows karate tournaments on you you. Uh, ESPN or whatever, right? It'll look more like that or whatever, because they're being conditioned. Um, in the West, a lot of things have come out of the 20s and 30s, and even the late uh, 1900, late 19th century, late 1800s, um, because boxing was a big thing, right? Either bare knuckle or whatever. And so you will see a lot of this working in. But, you know, from the uh, late 50s, early 60s, into the 70s, right? Um, Jun Ri brought Taekwondo, which was a combination of a warrior style of uh, Korean fighting and a uh, uh, monk style of Korean fighting, right? That he kind of combined, brought that to the United States. I think it was 1955, give or take, a couple of years. Um, and so back then, though, judo was prevalent, right? Watch James Bond movies. Right, They're doing freaking judo, right? That kind of stuff, right? And then karate, Japanese style karate kicked in. So people are then doing like they're doing these from the hip kind of shots and, and whatever, right? Before that, before that whole judo takeover kind of thing, right? Which was kind of a vestige of uh, what World War II vets and occupation, occupational forces learned while they were in Japan, starts to permeate into. American movies and Western movies and, and things like that, right? Before that, watch the fights in movies like in old uh, black and white, uh, whether they're action things or the thrillers or whatever, right? These guys are like, even well, even into the um, early to late 60s, 
uh, I'm I'm binge watching uh, uh, the original series. Well, not the original series because that goes back even farther. But um, the popular series uh, that the, the the movie The Saint was based on. Roger Moore starred as the Saint for eight years, I think. Right, but like big old freaking haul off, just punching the shit out of each other, or they jump on them and they're wrestling on the ground, throwing each other over tables and crap. Right. Um, all the movies that d- date back before that, right. It was this big old fisticuff things and shoving and, and jumping over a couch and tackling people and dragging them to the ground or grabbing a lamp and throwing at them. Right. Shit that looks like somebody's pissed off and they're, they're going at each other. Right. But the more these martial arts started to permeate things, right then that starts creeping in so you start to see more judo throws you start to see uh you know karate chops right and that's even what they called them <laughs> right back then right and then taekwondo kicks in to the point where even fucking space aliens are throwing taekwondo kicks and stuff when they're attacking people right and then and then and then right so uh, culture plays a lot into it but you're absolutely right i mean you know uh not I don't want to say not street thuggery because even those guys, right. They'll play off of like the gangsta stuff or whatever. I mean, you know, somebody popular in school said something and then everybody's doing it. Somebody popular, right. Or other people saw it was cool. Decided to turn a freaking handgun sideways. Right. And have their wrist bent. Right. To threaten somebody. And what you don't see is the number of people that pulled that trigger and blew their wrist out because, of that little action right um but this stuff this stuff permeates right and this stuff kind of kicks in where you see more of the stuff that i'm trying to convey to my students and you guys understand and dave was absolutely talking about this was those of us who have been in things where they didn't they didn't they don't watch a lot of tv or they're not from the west or they um they they just want to kill you Right. And they're going to do it by any means necessary. Right? So, um, I mean, you know, we, we could talk about from the dawn of time until the end of time, because ultimately shuriken, right. Hand thrown blades, right. Can be traced all the way back to the first time a human being picked up a fucking rock and threw it at somebody else. Right. So, cause it's just another thrown object to get something at a distance, right? The essence. This is what I'm talking about with this kotsu, the essential nature, right? What is this essential nature of a fight? It's a conflict between two people with a similar goal, but opposing agendas. And generally, they either don't know each other, so there's no vested interest, or they don't like each other. (coughs) Um, but this is an important piece, not an important piece of the training in the beginning is understanding the nature of a fight. This person is trying to beat, break, or kill you, right? Well, they're trying to win something. The nature of self-protection from a survival perspective is they are trying to beat, break, or kill you. Okay. But if you're really going to understand this, and I, I made I made mention of this, was it Whiteboard Wednesday, and maybe it carried over to Friday or whatever. But the past couple of classes, I've really tried to hammer this home. Right, the study of warfare is the study of warfare, and that takes into so many different takes into account so many different uh, realms and areas of study and whatnot. Right, um, but Ultimately, anybody that's aiming for advanced level stuff, right? Psychology and sociology and things. Not that you have to go to college courses and things like that. But they become more and more important. Because when we talk about the kotsu of an attack scenario or a fight or whatever, the essential nature, what is the essential nature of that attack? What are the combatants trying to accomplish? What is the reason behind why the aggressor or the attacker, the techie, has initiated this at all? 
Okay. Because that's going to play into you saving your ass to make sure you don't get ass raped by 10 guys in the prison shower um, because you misused use of force and you stepped outside of the self-defense paradigm, which is absolutely in a modern context. Now, think about all those techniques that everybody's learning. I only want to learn the traditional way. Well, those traditional ways are to kill somebody. Well, some of them have restraints. And, oh, yeah, of course they do, right? But ultimately, you're rendering a human body inoperable. You better be able to freaking justify that. Otherwise, I'd rather be tried by 12 than carried by 6. No, you fucking wouldn't. Because that'll be the least of your concerns if you lose. And then who's going to protect your family? Then it's a problem, right? Fighters think at such a microcosmic level. And warriors think at a much higher level. Okay. So uh, what's the nature of the, of the attack? What are they trying to accomplish? Because i got to tell you, an opportunistic attacker regardless of what he's coming at you with, is easier to handle than somebody who's targeted you. That's damn near impossible. Because if somebody's targeting you, the one guy doesn't get you, there's always somebody next. Being targeted is not the same. And this is what we're talking about with understanding the nature of warfare. right? And hey hole strategy military strategy understanding what your opponent is thinking understanding this this is not the same hatsumi sensei has always made the distinction between real budo bujutsu life or death stuff right and conventional martial arts always and since 1980 i have watched the masses more and more convert this into a conventional martial art. It's easier to learn that way. It's easier to talk about that way. Okay. And what's happened is it's become a martial arts choice among martial arts choices. When I came to this art, we didn't like using the term martial arts because of the way most people thought about martial arts. <clears throat> anyway, what else we got, James? Uh, Lee said all kinds of bullcrap comments, and, <clears throat> and you are paying attention to them. I believe you already know that, though, so there must be a deeper meaning to your actions. Kinds of bullcrap comments from the YouTube videos. Oh, yeah. Well, my my uh, my goal with all of this stuff, okay, I'm going to be completely transparent. Is to get the right people into the program so they can learn the stuff that they want to learn, that they want to have the ability, or they can get the abilities that they want to have. Okay. Um, and the way to do that in today's world using technology is to cast a wide net, which is why I have over 600 articles out circulating in, around the internet. Why I have how many videos? <laughs> I don't know. Um, and now we're starting to break these things down, the Kudan episodes and whatnot, because I know that most people, even the well-meaning ones, you know, they look at something, topics interested, and then they, the next thing they look at is what? Length of the video. Oh, shit, I'm not watching that. Worst thing that happened to good-natured uh, martial artists. YouTube shorts and TikTok. Now they binge watch one-tenth of one percent of a lesson and then go on to the next ones. It's just a replacement for fucking cat videos. I don't watch cat videos. Yeah, no, but it's just one entertainment, one that, okay? I'm learning. When was the last time you isolated one of those and spent a week working on that technique in that 15 to 60 second video? 
That's not learning. Anyway, so um, yeah, when people, you know, kudos for putting up with all this crap. And one, you have to understand that the monsters come out. Two, I'm easy to find. Nobody showed up yet. Right? I say yet. Who knows? Right? Um, and three, I have to get in front of as many people as possible so that the ones who are looking for this, and a lot of them don't even know what it's called. And I don't mean they don't know the word needs to. They don't know the word needs to. They have seen bad shit. They have an idea of skills that they want to have and, and knowledge and abilities and whatnot. They just don't know that it has a name. I was that way. Okay. And then they start to see things. Well, maybe. Okay. And again, this goes right back to what's happening at the academy. It's happening online. Like all the most recent conversations I've been having, well, for quite a while online, but most recently at the dojo, holy shit. Oh, yeah, I've been listening to your kuden, and I didn't realize you were this close to me. Uh, I've been watching Whiteboard Wednesday. I, you know, that mom today. Oh, yeah, you know, I've been watching some of your videos and all that, and this would be really great for my teenage daughter because she's about to move out into the world. And yeah, no, I saw the other stuff too. No, okay. Your stuff makes sense. Okay? Nobody explains it that way. Oh, good. I mean, she'll have an edge. <laughs> so anyway. Um, yeah. So uh, again, just like I was discussing at the very beginning, uh, we are breaking these things down into smaller clips so that they're e more easily digestible. I get it. People have lives, right? Um, I had people that had to sign off last Monday because I didn't realize that our celebration uh, episode was going to go as long as it did. But I'm breaking these things down into smaller things because I, instead of making more content, James, how many how many hours of audio only from the coaching calls do we have over at Instant Teleseminar? 15, 1,500 hours? I was going to say at least 1,500. At Easy. least 1,500 hours. Right. Um, that's just coaching calls, me teaching on certain topics that are not, um, uh, it's not that they're not mentioned in the dojo, but I don't have the time to be teaching the techniques and the skills and then going that deep into some of these other things. Right. And answering questions for students that lead into other topics, psychology, sociology, anthropology, a la 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 gee. Right. <laughs> so, um, but we've got that plus, you know, I, you know, I'm going to end up with more shorts and shorter videos and, and all that just be, based on these things between this and uh, I'm even going to pull some of the uh, Tuesday and Friday class footage and little snippets from past camps and all that kind of stuff just because I want to get a bunch of stuff out there. Um, <coughs> goodness. Um, so, yeah. It's all good. Uh, what else? So the, the big thing with this is there are there are certain things that and this is this goes for Whiteboard Wednesday, that goes for this, this goes for any any free webinars I ever do in the future, but with all this stuff that I'm putting out, it kind of starts uh, taking away from what I need to make sure the dojo functions and all that. So um, the uh, the thing will be to make sure that students get what they need. I have that written down here. It's just taking notes. Um, yeah, so... Um, Actually, I might as well lay this out. So over the course of the next 12 to 15 episodes, right? these are not the topics, but these are things that do two things. One, they're going to help students take the next step that want to take the next step. 
right? So, yep, yeah, I'm going to be mentioning programs and stuff like that more often. If that ruffles anybody's feathers, sorry, got to pay the bill. What you see is free on your end, cost me a butt ton of money on my end, right? This stuff is not free. All these services, whatever. Yes, I know Facebook and YouTube are free, but the service I use to simulcast through all these things and to do the editing and whatever, not so much. So those who want to take the next step, they need to know how to do that. And two, I need to make sure, see, this goes beyond you learning topics, me just teaching on things. This goes to the heart of what does one of these quote unquote good students what do they need to believe? What do they need to, need to understand? Right again, kuden shinden. Right. So just quickly off the top of my head, right, and these these will make up the next these things will make up the next, like I said, twelve to fifteen episodes because these are going to be a core piece of everything moving forward. Okay, we've lasted for two hundred episodes, two hundred one now. Right. This is just telling you what's going to happen next. Right. And these are in no particular order because these just I wrote them on a freaking envelope. Right. So. Um, again, I'm just going to read down through the list, but again, don't write these things down as though that's the next one. That's the next. one. OK, so um, evaluating your intent, motives and goals. So how to do that, why to do that, why it's important. OK. Right? Um, the fact that students need a plan for progress and what constitutes a good plan or a good structure for process or for progress, right? Um, the fact that not every lesson is important and uh, the need to focus on what's important now. Um, <laughs> here's a big belief that I think all people have anyway that, that come to me as students, right? Uh, my size, age, and shape should prove that everyone can do this. Tired of hearing people say, um, well, I'm going to lose about 20 pounds, or I got to do this, or I got to do this. No, what you have to do is decide that you're going to do this. I think I mentioned this in a previous episode, right? Are you interested in doing this, or are you committed to doing this? Those are not the same thing, and both, both, um, both create a different path. Okay. Uh, one of my guys, and I'm not going to call out any names at the moment, but um, the, he he hit this in two stages. The first one was when he, when he reached out to actually enroll in the program. He had been doing webinars and all kinds of things before that, but reached out and said, it's time. I got to do this. I'm, I'm pulling the trigger. I'm going to do it. Okay. Jumped in the program and then was with the program for quite a while and then scheduled a one-on-one -on -one and said, okay, now I have a, a specific plan and agenda and this is no longer about generally doing it. This is about specific outcomes. Okay, so these things happen in phases, right? Uh, next, this is not something. This is not something to do, like a pastime or an interest. This is to be used in life, right? This is not something that I do. This is so much a part of who I am that I can't not do it. To not do this is like not breathing. It relates to everything in my life, which is difficult to do when all you do, not you, because you guys are all enlightened, but it's difficult to do when someone is only doing. Right. Uh, number next, uh, how to make sense out of chaos, logic in the lessons, right? In the kata, right? What is it conveying other than the step-by-step, -step, right? And again, whatever you're translating it as is the best that you can do, which is why we get teachers, which is why we get mentors, right? Because as long as they're not like just a little bit better than you, right? They can see things that you don't even know is going on, which is the point. The point is to get to a point where when the attacker comes, he's he has no 
freaking idea how out of his league he is because he can't see. This is the art of invisibility. Not that you're doing sneaky shit and disappearing in a puff of smoke. You can see things and you can do things and you're watching for things that he doesn't even know are going on. And when you do things, the way you do them and the reason you're doing them are virtually invisible to him because, again, he doesn't know what he's looking at. This is not about being different to be different. That's a style. This is being different because your perspective and what you're looking at and what you're looking for and your understanding of, of hey hole military tactics and seishin, not just your own knowledge, but understanding how different personality types operate. Oh, it just, they have no idea that they're going to come at you. Yes, they're dangerous. Yes, they have a weapon and all that. But it's like a six-year-old having a debate with a mature adult. They think they know everything. Their stuff makes sense to them. But they have such a limited view of the world that... Right? So... Number next, uh, strategy and tactics make the techniques work in combat, not the other way around. Okay. Uh, this is about warriorship, being powerful and engaging with the world. Right? Drop the victim mentality. So tired of hearing. Just and and often it's side comments by the mo by the by the most well-meaning students, but it grates on my ears. And they don't even know they're doing it. All right. uh, let's see. You must be willing to do what most won't. Not a cliche. But until you start looking at what most people won't, how the hell do you know what to do? All right. uh, focusing on the eight gates, right? That's the primary function, eight gates of the ninja, right? Uh, the eight keyhole areas. Uh, let's see. You can do this. Long distance. Okay. How? Why? Right. It's historical. Back to historical again. Right. Uh, let's see. And why the program is the way it is. Context. Right. And those are just quick notes that I threw out. Um, but that's, that's going to be at the crux of all these things, regardless of what the topic looks like and sounds like. Right. Um, the biggest thing that's getting in the way of most people is their belief about one of three things themselves, others, or the world. And ultimately the connection between those three things, okay. what they're capable of, what the world's all about, who's out to get them. Nobody's out to get it, whatever. Okay. So anyway, what else, James? Uh, the only other thing was uh, Leonard said I don't get the argument between traditional or modern ninjutsu if things have been different and the ninja kept on I believe they'd adapt as the times changed hmm. cool beans right um, yeah but the essential nature of the art never changed I remember going to a seminar uh, with my first teacher in this art. And it was one that I had gone through twice before because I understand that it, the lessons may be the same, but the group of students that are present for those lessons are going to modify how the teacher presents the lessons. I, I say this a lot when I do my spring and fall uh, camps, my daikomiosai that here's the plan topics and i do enter the seminar with a plan but it is subject to be adjusted throughout based on skill levels right general skill level understanding and things like that of the students and i've been known to swap out topics i let everybody know that i'm doing it but it, it has to be done right um, 
as opposed to just ignoring everybody and this is my agenda and okay. so the kotsu is ultimately uh, at the heart of everything there there are these people running around making up modern ninjutsu because of their understanding that ninjutsu was just a mix of a bunch of things doesn't make it ninjutsu i've said this how many times before you can say that a dog's tail is another leg right if we say the dog's tail is a leg now how many legs does the dog have if you answered five it's incorrect because just calling the tail a leg doesn't make it so okay you can call anything whatever you want. People do it all the time these days. Doesn't make it so. Makes it so to me. Great. Yeah. That's all that's necessary. But that's not all that's necessary for them. If it were, they wouldn't be trying to bully everybody else to fucking see it their way. Weak people need everybody else to conform. Strong people couldn't give a shit less if they're the only one in the room who believes what they believe. They're confident in their own skin. Most battles in human history have occurred because both sides wanted the other one to do what they want, not being okay with the other side. Not to mention that they wanted shit that the other ones had because they didn't have any where they set up camp. Okay. Anyway. Is that it? That's all we have? Yes, sir. Man, freaking fantastic. James, anything you, you want to throw on top of this? No. See? You're right. It would have been the shortest episode in the <laughs> history of Kudan. <laughs> All right. Well, the upside is we didn't go three hours. So, um, but we're breaking these things down. We're breaking whiteboard Wednesdays down, all that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, for those of you who are, you know, looking for a little extra help or uh, considering taking that next step and want to know what that's all about or whatever, right? Uh, you can book a call. You just shoot an email over to Warrior C at Warrior Concepts Online.com. And in the subject line, put call request. Uh, please tell me a little bit about yourself, your training background, your goals, um, and some days and times you would be available for about a 30 to 45 minute call if it goes that long. Um, and then I'll see if something matches up on my, uh, on my calendar. Please, please, please do not tell me how much money you don't make, how much time you don't have, how much permission from your significant other you don't have, uh, whatever. Um, not going to be helpful okay because my next question is going to be what are you doing to change that if you don't know that's a whole different conversation okay so this is pretty much like um the problem that most people have who work as managers when their people are walking all over them they don't turn shit on on time they do barely enough to not get fired all that kind of stuff right um I'm the, I'm the same way, okay? I will ask, what is your plan for fixing the condition you're in so that you can move forward? Or what is your plan for letting go of this fantasy about being a master warrior or a ninja or whatever and go seek something easier? If the answer is I don't have one or I'm not going to get one, my response is going to be, I think you think that there's a third option, and that's why the condition never changes. Okay? So, and I'm not speaking to anybody anyway, then my teachers have not spoken to me. This isn't the abuser passing things on because it, it's not that thing, right? The number of people who want to be a strong warrior who won't do the shit that's uncomfortable is just absolutely fucking astounding. Astounding. It's astonishing. I think I just tried to shove two words together. Anyway, so this is what it is. And I hate that phrase too. But I'm going to end this 
same way I pop something out probably somewhere in the middle. Are you interested in doing this or are you committed in making it happen? Committed to making it happen. Okay. All excuses and all things. If, if I have trained with people that were absolutely fucking blind, couldn't see a spotlight in their face, and I've trained with people who were, uh, were had prosthetic legs and, and all kinds of stuff, right? We can all figure it out. Okay? But if your idea of figuring it out is like a lot of kids who frustrate their parents so their parents give them the answers so they can get their homework done and not have to think, that's not my job. My job isn't just to pass on techniques and to regurgitate historical facts to save everybody from going and reading and studying themselves. My job is to help people get over the laziness, the misguided sense of self, the whatever's going on that was either inherited or self-generated that is preventing them from becoming the Tatsu gene that's inside of them. It's fully actualized human being. You cannot be a fully actualized human being by somebody else doing the fucking work for you. And don't tell me I don't understand. Maybe that's the problem. It's not that I don't understand. And that's it for this one. So hopefully I'll see most of you, if not all of you, on the next episode. And if not, I understand. See you next time. Get more of Kudan Radio. Subscribe through your favorite podcasting site or join our clan of serious modern warriors at onlineninjaacademy.com.